Anyway, if, if, uh, if everybody's here and you're all sitting comfortably, I uh, just have to go through uh, one or two little points before we start it. Uh, firstly, the video is being recorded, uh, both in sound and vision, uh, and will be kept on the uh, Guild video site for at least the next month. Uh, so if you don't want your image to be seen on the site, you can press stop video and uh, it'll take your video off. The other thing is, if we can all stay muted, apart from myself, Steve Robinson and Tony Peck, who, uh, who we're going to be interviewing about his layout, the Great St. Bomber Railway. Have I pronounced that correctly? Hello, Very Tony. Thank you. Did I pronounce that correctly? The Great St. Bonner Railway? No? All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I hope we all enjoy the show. And tell us about your railway, Tony. Okay. Well, it, it was actually started on my 70th birthday. Um, when we first came to France, I was fully occupied rebuilding a house. And then later, sadly, my wife died and I've moved elsewhere. And again, there was a load more building work to be done. And then there's a lot of land, so that involved a lot of workers. But finally, with nothing else to do, um, it was back to Gay Joe. I was originally a guild member shortly after it first started, but with other activities, my membership lapsed. So I restarted it in 1970 and built an O-gauge line in the garden. But the, the land here slopes to um, ooh, something like 50 degrees to the horizontal. So building a conventional circuit was out of the question. So it's an end-to-end -end line which follows the contour of the land. Mm -hmm. And although I thought of building a return loop at one end, it would be actually end up being five meters in the air, which isn't realistic, at least <laughs> not at my age. So, um, so an end-to-end -end line it is. It's about 60 metres from one end to the other, so it's quite a good long run. It certainly is, isn't it? And actually, it didn't, it didn't take very long. The main building didn't take very long at all, actually, only a couple of months or so. But it's then, as everybody knows, it's all the details, the buildings, rolling stock, miles and miles of wiring, about, was it about 600 metres of wear, I think. Mm -hmm. So... That's what takes the time. It certainly does. I'm impressed with that enormous viaduct you have. Well, strangely, that didn't take very long at all. It only took under two weeks to build. And actually, to take out the old temporary wooden viaduct and put the new one in and start the trains running again took just two hours. Crikey, crikey. I take it's, 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 I think, it's, I don't think uh, Network Rail can manage that. <laughs> I take it it's modelled on something like the uh, Eiffel viaducts uh, in uh, central yes, it France. Is. It's, it's uh, about 100 kilometres from here is the um, Viaduct de Garibay, which mm -hmm. was built by um, Eiffel for the railway line that goes from Paris to... Um, what did it go to? Some, some be um, to to Bezier. Mio. It's, yes, it's a single single track electrified now it is. Mm -hmm. um, but when the viaduct was built, it was actually the largest span and the highest viaduct in the world. Yes, and the my, my uh, sorry, I said the only thing is yours is blue, and that one's a sort of a red oxide colour, isn't it? Well, that 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 was my wife's choice. <laughs> in, <laughs> but it, in, in fact. Um, the way, the way it was built, well, it's somewhat similar, obviously, the, um, the Eiffel design, rather like the Eiffel Tower, um, was built with a lot of very small parts of metal that were man-portable, because you have the huge machines and lifting gear that you have now. Whereas, you know, there was out of the question to build anything quite so complicated, so it was a simplified design. And um, I drew it out on CAD first and got, rather than draw it full size. I just printed out a load of coordinates. Then uh, with a large piece of um, uh, OSB for each half, if half of the arch, I knocked panel pins in and bent the, the main pieces of metal to that shape. The, um, 
all the, then a load of little V's were then bent round in a, in a little jig, mm -hmm. all set out with panel pins, and then I just used the MIG welder, put a dab of weld on each joint. I said the whole thing didn't take very long at all. So then I had um, f four half arches, um, which the two they were put together in pairs and the cross is welded in. And the deck is just one long three meter long, bit twin, uh, three meter long deck made of twin angle irons. And then the whole lot was bolted together on the site. And it's based on two huge blocks of granite and getting those down the hill and maneuvering them into place, that was <coughs> quite hard work. I'll bet it was. Bet but it's, it, it's an actually, it would actually support my weight without any problem. Crikey, so it's incredibly strong. Hmm. <coughs> what did take a long time was make, well, was more tedious anyway, was making the fencing to go along it. That again was done in a jig. Um, with lots of pa with panel pins, wires stretched along the panel pins, and then uh, again, uh, uh, no, there was one welded. Then a dab of solder on each one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tim Stubbs so, is asking, uh, could you say so, something about the the wheel lathe? Is it based on a real prototype? Yeah, yes, that, that's on my other video. Um, for cleaning the track, which most people know. Um, Railway wheels need reprofiling regularly, and um, since about the 1970s, um, underground wheel lace came into use. Where instead of lifting the train and removing the wheels to be returned, um, they could just be driven driven into the wheel lathe and turned in situ on the vehicle. And um, most modern, large modern depots are equipped with them. So my fictitious scene is the LMS actually invented this before the war. So I've got a little shed that says LMS CME department wheel lathe. What it actually is though, is um, revolving brass wire brushes. Let's drive the loco in, um, run the loco wheels, to, uh, spinning over the revolving wire brushes. Well, in fact, even, even the nun mode wheels will clean quite happily on it. Um, the revolving brushes spin the wheel of the bogies and tr pony trucks just as well. And um, it's a bit noisy because it's a bit crude, the, the version I've made, but it's quite effective. Cleans up all the wheels, keeps it running. What, what mm. effect does the weather have on, on the line then? Well, it's here we get bigger extremes of temperature than, than we had in Britain, um, sometimes down to minus 15 in the winter and pretty hot in the summer. The, the rails in the summer, the rails are much too hot to touch. But the Pico track stands up to it very well. There are no, no problems there at all. The problem is track bonds with the rails expanding and tracting. I'd used um, just plain wire soldered in a loop across each joint. Mm -hmm. and that both the solder joint and the wire itself fatigue and break. So if I was starting an outdoor line again, what I would do is no track bonds at all, uh, is to run um, 2.5 square millimetre wires, the length of the track, and then just connect a lead to each section of rail. Yeah. Um, then it wouldn't be affected by the expansion and contraction of the rails. The other yeah. thing is... Um, I found is wood ex expands enormously when in damp weather. And my original swing bridge, um, this isn't shown on this, really shown on this video, but it's, it was an article in the Guild magazine a few years ago, which showed my swing bridge. But it, it's, um, although it's made in metal, the same as the viaduct, the abutments were in timber and the between the bridge and the abutments could vary from, with the changes of weather, from zero to 10 millimetres. Right. So the solution in the end was to build a second bridge in steel upside down to form the abutments, so which would expand and contract by the same amount as the bridge. And it aligns and works perfectly now. I can open and shut it as often as I like with no problem. Mm -hmm. um, um, Tim, Stubbs has also mentioned he's delighted to see the use of your tail lamps on, on your vehicles. Are they fixed in position? Um, well, the, the ones that work are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, the older rolling stock it doesn't have it hasn't been um, wired to take permanent tail lamps, so they're just removable ones. But anything I've built more recently has um, pickups on the wheels and working tail lamps. Mm -hmm. So you use the power from the track to power the tail lamps. Yes. Yeah. And do you use? It's best to do that. It's best, although I haven't done it. It's best to have a capacitor because then, if there are little interruptions of, of pickup, because things like a, a freight guards van isn't very heavy. Um, so if you have a capacitor somewhere hidden inside it, it tends to bridge any little gaps or interruptions in power supply. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you use DC or uh, digital control? I wasn't very confident that digital control would work on an outdoor line of that length, so it's straight DC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and obviously the, the out, outdoor leg, there's no points in it, is, is there? There's no what? Is there any points in your outside leg? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, um, the things, most of the line isn't visible from the control point. The control room is the terminus, which is in um, a cellar under a barn. Mm -hmm. And um, the first, the first um, 15 metres or so, the line is visible. The next bit I can see on a TV camera, and there's a... a, a um, set of points where the line reduces from double track to single track to go over the viaduct to Garraby, because the original was single track. Mm -hmm. um, and that's operated as just an ordinary Pico point motor um, operated by a capacitor discharge unit. And it works reasonably well, but it does tend to suffer from stiction after it's not been used for some time. Um, at the, other, the station at the other end of the line has its own control point, so the points there are mechanically driven by point rodding, except for one that's out of reach, and again, that has a, a point motor on it with a capacity discharge unit. There's a little problem. Um, electrical units like um, solenoids for um, points, which would be on the reach of point wires, uh, sorry, um, cables, uh, are in a little lion's side hut and of course insects go in there to make a nest in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> and does that, does that cause any short circuit problems? Well they don't cause a short circuit but um, they tend to bung things up a bit. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. I know I had an outside line once and uh, a similar problem occurred but I got slugs inside and they electrocuted themselves. Do you have a similar problem? Yes. Well, in my in my youth, when I was still at school, I used to work part time at Beck and Scott Model Village, mm -hmm. which was electrified at about twenty four to thirty volts, and there were several large ponds in the in the uh, in the whole area, and. Um, I was in the cold control room and then the red light would come on to indicate that they derailed to a fault somewhere and almost always it was a pair of frogs that had come out of the pond to mate and the pair of mating frogs would be electrocuted on the track and run over by a locomotive and they had open bottom gearboxes so the gear the frog would be wound up through the gear so I had to lift up the loco turn the wheels backwards and throw the, the frogs back in the pond then it would happen again, and I'd find a pair of electrocuted frogs on the track with teeth marks on their arm, so they'd obviously been through a gearbox and come back to do it again. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a serious frog problem, isn't it? Not the sort of problems that you normally associate with model railways. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, when did you well, move I, to France? I, I, sorry? When did you move to France? Um, well, it wasn't like that really. We, in uh, 2001, we bought a house as a holiday home. And um, when my wife retired in 2005, we were spending no little time in England. There was really no point in keeping the house there. So we decided to, to sell up in England and to just live in France. So it happened quite slowly over a period of years. 
And um, sadly, then my wife died shortly afterwards, so she didn't get much use out of the house. Oh, and um, I live in a different house, only f half a kilometre away, um, with my present partner, who used to be our French teacher. And this is where the land now sleeps steep, so steeply, mm. but anything's possible. So, but of course, I've seen that part of your layout is, is as you describe it, in the is it a cellar under the barn? Is, is that where it is, you say? No, sorry. Uh, so it sounds not very good. Is you saying that part of your layout is in a cellar under a barn? Yes, it, it, it starts off in a cellar under the barn, so that's the main terminus. And there's a picture of that on the introduction to this video. Um, and so th that terminus is actually loosely based on Wakefield. I've called it Wakefield St Bonnie because St Bonnie is the name of our village and Wakefield was the maiden name of my late wife. So <laughs> um, then from, the, from there the rest of it is, is entirely outdoors yeah and it's it stays there all the year round so the buildings are intended to be all weather buildings um, as is everything else. Do you come from the Yorkshire area originally then? Oh, I was born in Sheffield, but that was a very long time ago, obviously. Yeah. Uh, even Sheffield classes as Yorkshire. <laughs> Just about, yes. Yeah. Well, in fact, I did live I, I did live in Belper for quite a long time because I, I worked for British Rail in Derby. Uh -huh. but obviously, you've been attracted to uh, the Midland line up through uh, Skipton and that way. Is that what you've based your layout on? Um, well, I only, I, in fact, I probably would have made it Great Western, but um, there's another, another guild member lived in, in our village and he built quite a lot of LMS locos, but had no railway to run them on. So I just said, better be LMS. And um, <laughs> LMS and Midland's as good as anything. <laughs> Why not? Why not? So you say there's another guild member in your village? Well, he's moved back to England now, unfortunately. But, um, oh. Well, we, 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 we migrate all over the world, don't we? So, sorry, can you sorry, hear? I don't, I'm not here. not here. I say we migrate all over the world, don't we, from Yorkshire? Yes, yeah. Oh, you're a Yorkshireman too, then? Well, actually, no, I just live here. Uh, I'm from north of the oh, world, right. Durham. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So, is there anybody, anybody got any questions for Tony about his layout? Please just type them out and we'll, uh, we'll see if there's any questions. In fact, I'd say See, there's only, there's only seven of us in the room. If you want to unmute yourselves and ask the questions, by all means do so. Um, there isn't that many people in here now, so uh, it may be easy just to switch your microphones on and, uh, and, and have a chat. Anybody want to say anything? Well, Tim's saying you're see, see. impressive. Hello, Tony. I'm Tim. I uh, also worked on the railway in Derby. I wonder if we met. Uh, yes, unfortunately, there's a Zoom banner um, across across your face. I can't actually see you. Oh. <laughs> uh, can't, can't be. Yeah. I can see your mouth, but that's all, unfortunately. Okay, yeah. yeah I, also, I also used to work uh, uh, for British Rail in Derby. I wondered if we met. Don't know. Where, where were you? I was in the Railway Technical Centre. Yes, I was too. Uh, I was on the ill-fated APT project. What's your surname? Peck. I think we may have done. Yes. I knew people like I, Richard. I, I, well, of course, the other, the other thing is we've all aged a lot since then, so it's hard <laughs> to recognise people. Can't help that, can we? I think your, your railway is very impressive. You mentioned one in a hundred gradients. The locomotives manage that all right, do they? Usually, although I found the um, Black Five now with the pulling a freight train is slipping badly. Um, 
So I need to look to look at the weight balance on it. But partially, of course, the pickups on the guards vans act as brakes. Yes, of course. Electrical pickups. Yeah. Um, but mm. otherwise, yeah, it's okay. I've got a garden railway with one in a hundred gradients on it as well. Not quite as long as yours, about um, right. 45 metres roughly. Mm -hmm. Well, I had to have some gradient, otherwise it would have been far too high above the ground at the other end. Yes, well, my land slopes it, not, it, not it, as much as yours. It, it, well, it starts at about um, two metres below ground level at one end, because I said it's a cellar under, under a barn. Yes. And ends up about a metre above ground at the other yeah, end. Yeah, the other end, yeah, yeah. Uh, I looked at the videos, they're very good. I like them. Yes, yeah, so the, the video on this session actually was, um, was one of my first attempt at doing a video. A subsequent, another, another one. So if you if you go onto YouTube and, and in the search box put Great St. Bonnie Railway, there is um, a full video of the railway. I've, I've seen one uh, cab view, which you've taken end to end on yeah. the whole line. Yeah, well, the other one is actually a, a descriptive video of, or of more or less a, a, a slide commentary of the whole thing. And it's just it, the title of the video is just Great St. Bonnie Railway. Thank you. I'll do St. that. Bonnie, obviously. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thank you very much. Right. Has anybody else got any questions? Mm. It uh, looks like we've run out of questions for you, Tony. Yes. I'd just like to say okay. thank you very much for coming and taking part in the show, for letting us have your video of your layout, um, and I hope that uh, you've enjoyed yourself and that you continue to enjoy the show and all the other layouts and demonstrations. And don't forget, what you missed today, you can watch for the next month. And you'll be able to even watch yeah. yourself back well, as well later. Congratulations to the organisers. I think they've done a really good job. Well, on behalf of the whole team, I'll say thank you for, uh, for saying that. Thank you. OK, then. Well, if there's, if there's nobody else got any more questions, it looks like it's about tea time for you. So uh, we'll let you get off. Thank you very okay, much. Then. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.